You are our very breath. We praise you and thank you that you have chosen to breathe in us, to dwell in us, to occupy us. So tonight be glorified in everything we do. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. I'm going to get a few things, making sure that it's up and running like it's supposed to. So I'm going to have to multitask a lot here tonight. Got to run this and this. All right. Now, before we jump into this, this is really loud. Is it, is it loud out there to you guys or just the, is it just the monitors? I think I'm hearing the monitors. <clears throat> so when I was looking at this, um, this is a, a presentation that I did at a prophecy conference in El Paso at the end of October. And what was so amazing to me is how much even this presentation had changed because um, it was, I think I did this on a Saturday. And the following Wednesday was the elections that took place in the nation of Israel. And if you have been paying, how many of you have been paying attention to what's happened in Israel since October? Okay. They have um, since now re-elected um, Benjamin Netanyahu as their prime minister. And it was, they, how many of you, there's a bunch of questions I'm going to have to ask. How many of you know how the government there works, how it's structured? No? <laughs> yeah, does anyone. Um, for those of you that don't, what we have here is a two-party system, mainly. You know, they can have a multitude of other parties, but really it's Republicans and Democrats. You have the House and the Senate you know, two separate bodies in the Congress, and then you have the executive branch of the president. In other places in Europe, you'll find parliamentary. So there's a governing body, and there's a certain number of those people there, and then they work on majorities. Who has those majorities? In this, in in Israel, it's known as the Knesset or the gathering. Knesset means a gathering. So the Knesset is 120 uh, members, and the number of parties... Gosh, I think last I checked, there's about 11 or 12 parties making up those 120 seats. So usually the way that it works, whichever party has the largest presence, the the most amount of seats in the Knesset, after an election is supposed to then see if they can put together a governing coalition, so 61 or more. And if they can get those groups together and on board with their direction, then they will make that person the prime minister. Now, you'll hear about there being a president in Israel, which is basically a formality and, you know, kind of official business type things. But the country is run through the Knesset, and whoever is the head of the Knesset is going to be that prime minister, and that's who Benjamin Netanyahu is. The last um, administration was really, really cobbled together of some people that could not agree on anything. And so the last coalition had people, they do have their right and left flanks politically like we have here. And you're going to find that there's the similarities there versus here is really, really, really interesting. The, the last one had a whole number of people in it who just didn't like Benjamin Netanyahu and used to be part of the Likud, which is his party. And so they broke off and they had a, a group of, of people that were between Arabs. They had the right and the left of the political gambit just to find a way to get to 61 plus. And it was so fragile. There was no way it was ever going to be able to exist. So this time around, um, I'm going to show you who is part of it now because as you've been studying along with uh, the, the, the uh, study through Revelation, and when you start to look at, at the topic of the end times, it, it's pretty much a, a foregone conclusion that there is no greater single indicator of where we are in time than Israel. And, you know, I, I happen to be a person who takes very, very, or pays very close attention to Israel. It's one of the reasons why I like going there and taking people there so that they become familiar with what the place is like. So since Netanyahu has made it back in, uh, into office, my goodness, if you were reading the, the news that's coming out of there, it is, it is like every bit the worst of what it was like during the Trump years here. And uh, the, the extremes of both sides are just having at one another. And the same 
crazy accusations. I'm going to show you some examples of it are, are right there in front of you. And so I'll show you some, some news articles. But more importantly, where we start today, because it's going to be, I think, a very important component of what the Antichrist will ultimately be able to do in brokering the peace that is spoken of from what we have of it in the text, in the Bible, that there is going to be something that the, the Antichrist is going to be able to put together, which we would think of it in, in our modern terms. How on earth are you going to ever get the Jews to be able to build a temple with all of the Muslim influence, and especially if it's being put up on the Temple Mount next to the, that golden dome, the Dome of the Rock? How are you going to possibly be able to do that? And so whether we realize it or not, there's a framework that I believe is going to be used in some ways to get the, the masses to agree with it. And I'll, I'll show that to you. How many of you remember that during the Trump years, they put together a thing that was known as the Abraham Accords? Anybody heard the term, the Abraham Accords? I'm going to show you what it is, and I'm going to show you what it's based on and why it was interesting to me when I read it for the first time. And uh, that goes back to... Uh, January of 2020, before we moved out here from California, I went through it with my church that was there, the church that I pastored, and we took three weeks going through it. And we're not going to do that tonight or else we'd be here till like midnight. So uh, I'll spare you all of that. I want to start with Jeremiah 30 and then a passage from Amos. And I just want to ask you some simple questions because it is something that is still debated, if you will, or even discussed Nowadays, and, and uh, we're familiar with the term uh, replacement theology. I'm going to have to relocate this. Excuse me, everyone. Okay, the little pack for this. Um, when, you, um, when you hear the, the term replacement theology, whenever they try to make the case for it, they're always going to have to use the New Testament as their evidence, just like they do with Calvinism and the rest of it. You have to use the Old Testament to try to prove a New Testament type of a, of a doctrine in the church, which is really strange. When you start going through the Old Testament, you don't have room for replacement theology. And I want to point that out to you in these first two before we start to look at some of the maps and things like that. So let's, uh, let's come before the Lord and ask him to help me pull all of this together. This was more than an hour's long um, uh, presentation in El Paso, and I've got 40 minutes. So strap in. And uh, you can play this back at half speed later. Father, we thank you for, uh, for the time that we can spend looking into your word and, and uh, looking into things that will be happening in the future, best as we can tell. But we are to see the, the big pieces as you put them together and, and as the, we see them begin to fit. We would ask, Lord, that you would help us to be careful of the days in which we live and what our task is in these times for the church. And so we give you all thanks and ask that by your Holy Spirit you would make known to us the things that we should know. We give you thanks and, and all praise in Jesus' name. Amen. One of my favorite passages that you see here <clears throat> is from Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 2 to 3. It says, Thus speaks the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write in a book for yourself all the words that I have spoken to you, for behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will bring back from captivity my people Israel and Judah. Now, if you just read through it and you just don't take the time, to realize the importance of just even the wording there, and Jeremiah does this more than any of the other prophets, using them as two distinct groups, it helps you to understand that historically from the time that he or even Amos, which I'll show you next, from the time that they said it, it had never ever taken place. Sure, Israel had come back, or Judah had come back to the land after their captivity with Nebuchadnezzar, but the, the north had long since been gone, what we know as Israel. But the, the reason he makes the distinction between Israel and Judah should make us think the split before uh, Rehoboam and Jeroboam, going all the way back to the time of Solomon, Israel as a combined nation has not existed in the land until our modern times. So when he says, Israel and Judah, says the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers and they shall possess it. So for the replacement theology people, we realize that God made the covenant with the people and with the land, and it had both components to it. So if the church has replaced Israel, we don't, we don't get the land, and the land was, was part of the people in the spiritual sense of it. The, it it's all intertwined. You can't separate them out. They, they cannot be separated. So if people would look at that and say, well, he brought them back after the Babylonian captivity, were they displaced again? They sure were by the time after Jesus and, uh, and the Romans had displaced them. But still, it didn't include Israel. 
and they were not sovereign in their land. The Romans kind of ran the, the show at that point. So they were displaced for 1,900 years. What I would say to you, and I would have anybody who would not agree with that, show me historically when this has taken place before 1948, when they were declared a nation again, because they were sovereign over their country, and even more so as time's gone by, and I'm going to show you that in the maps. The one that I have here from Amos is, to me, just every bit as impressive, and probably even more so because of how he, he uh, puts an end to the, the, there will no longer be displacements. I will bring back the captives, uh, captives of my people, Israel. Notice he just says Israel. And uh, they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink from them. They shall also make gardens and eat fruit from them. I will plant them in their land. This is obviously God speaking. And no longer shall they be pulled up from the land that I have given to them, says the Lord your God. So you have to ask yourself the question, when did this happen historically? Hasn't. From the time that Amos wrote it, rather, until the middle of last century, it wasn't even a potential. So the day will come when God finally gathers them into the land again. And once he's done that for the last time, it will not be reversible as it has been throughout their history. And that's the intention of, of God being able to say, they can be displaced, but the time will come when I'll assemble them in the land and it's never going to take place again. So if you think about it, from the time of Solomon up until the middle of last century, the passages that we've just looked at here weren't even a potential of fulfillment. So that, I mean, that carries, that's 2,500 years. That's a very, very long time for something to be spoken and left unresolved, but I would posit that it is. And uh, I'll show you some of the reasons why as we start to go through this. Now, the Abraham Accords, we'll end up getting to what those are here in just a moment, because I'm going to take a look at the actual, um, uh, some of the, the text from it, and we're going to look at some of the news from there. But becoming familiar with the actual nation itself and how it's come together, it may be a little hard to read up at the top, but this, if you were to, to hear people talk about the, the Golan Heights, and the West Bank, and the Gaza Strip, they're all represented right here. Let me see if I can make this. Yeah, it works. How about that? Okay, so up here, we hear the Golan Heights all the time, right? You'll hear the West Bank is spoken of all the, all the time. Biblically, that means Judea Samaria. When you hear Judea Samaria, think West Bank. But look at how much of the country is mentioned in that when you think this is your, your country that's being spoken of here, and that is the Gaza Strip. So those three very important bits of territory are something that after the 67 war, Israel took back. And up until the middle of the 2000s, around 2006, even the Gaza Strip, there were Jews living in the Gaza Strip. It was given back in the never-ending land for peace. They would always give up land, but never got peace. And the Abraham Accords are a different thing, which I'll be able to show you. Uh, as far as this is concerned, they're always, Syria and Jordan and all the Muslim world are always saying you need to give back the Golan Heights. When we stay in uh, Israel, we stay on this coast of the Sea of Galilee and you're looking up at the Golan Heights. And there is not a chance that Israel would ever give it back because of its strategic territory. You're not going to do it because that imperils everybody that lives in this valley. If you give away the Golan Heights, nobody is safe. So you go back and read about what it was like before they took it back, and the people that lived here were constantly very, very close to some sort of shelter in case they started to be shelled from the high ground. Golan Heights, it's high ground. So that leaves this, and this is always contested because it's a huge portion of land. But I'll point out during our trips when we're there, when we're traveling, there's one day that we travel from here all the way down until we get to the Dead Sea right about in this area here. We're driving almost primarily through what is known as the, goal, or the, um, uh, the West Bank, Judea, Samaria, or areas that are held by the Palestinian Authority. And I'll tell you this, when you're driving through Israel, you can tell where the, the Jewish people have the jurisdiction and where the non-Jewish people have the jurisdiction because they don't care about the land. And it looks trashy. It's, a, it's an amazing thing. So if you've ever been there, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So this is what currently exists, all right? And why I'm showing you this is because of the next two, um, the next two especially uh, maps really helps you to understand what is being proposed currently. So this is what was proposed in 1947. Notice the similarities. 
Because once again, you have Gaza. Most of what we already knew by looking at is the West Bank. The only real difference is that the, the Palestinian Authority has really no say up in this area. And that's the area around Nazareth. So we're talking about up in the north. That's where Jesus was you know, kind of raised is out there in, in Nazareth, which is up in this area here. So this is what was proposed by the United Nations and the other countries that you can have the two states living side by side and here's the, here's the option. Israel said, yeah, we're on board. We'll do it. The Arabs, on the other hand, wanted nothing to do with it because they didn't want Jews in the land. So look at this. This is what I find really fascinating. Here is what the Abraham Accords are proposing. Does it look similar to you? You notice the differences here or the, the similarities? Look at what you have when it comes to Gaza. And this was, this was that 47. It's not currently even something in dispute. What they're talking about doing as part of this Abraham Accord is to take parts within the West Bank and so what you have is this, anything in this, this uh, natural color would be fully Israel. All of it will remain fully Israel according to the accords. But it would give some level of autonomy to any of these green areas, what would be under the control of the Palestinian Authority. And they would even be linking between the two territories there by some kind of rail system, either above ground or below ground. But it would give that, quote, two-state solution that they're talking about, and people would be able to have dual citizenship. Why this is so interesting to me is when I look at that 47 partition that was put up. So let me go back to it real quick and look at, I'll point you out this part again, that right there, and then how all of this part is what was first talked about. So then back to this, Abraham Accords, notice it? So what they're talking about wanting to do here is making this all industrial. So it would be that the Palestinian Authority, the Arabs, the Muslims, whatever you want to call them, would be able to have their own state inside the borders of Israel. Israel would be able to undo this in a heartbeat if terrorism starts to break out and everything else. But it really does a, this one very interesting thing. Now, let me just say for the record, I'm not a fan of this. I'm just talking about how different this is as far as the approach of land for peace than anything that we've ever seen before. It's always about if the Jews give up land, they'll get peace in exchange for it, and that's never happened. It's always been one-sided. They'll give up land. And so people would say, yeah, but God said you can't divide up the land. If you go through there, it's already divided. What this ultimately ends up doing is it kind of just codifies or puts into law what's already really kind of the reality on the ground. So what this proposal was, and here's the theory behind it and why it was so different. They're saying that if the people living in these areas here are successful and they are able to put together their industry and they're able to put together political um, uh, pacts with other countries outside of Israel that are non-Jewish, then it would really put downward pressure on the groups like here in Gaza known as Hamas or the terrorist element that's inside here that's like the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade and, and Fatah and the various you know, terrorist organizations that operate there. The people they're hoping will get to the point where they're just so fed up with their leadership that they overthrow them. That's the thought behind it because if you see everybody here around you doing really well in the area where they are, but you can't because your leadership won't allow you, they think that they're going to be able to get them to do a Ceausescu, if you know what I mean by that reference. Everybody know what I mean when I say Ceausescu? Okay, Ceausescu was the dictator in Romania 30 years ago. Remember when they chased him through the streets and killed him? Because they were just tired. The Romanians were tired of living under a tyrant. They're thinking that's kind of the same thing that would happen here. So it puts all kinds of pressure on... Did I do that? Wow. Oh, actually, you know what? I have that. <laughs> I should have been doing this the whole time. I had it kind of zoomed in. <laughs> Does this help you at all when it's a little bit bigger? Okay. <laughs> uh, so anyhow, what you have here, again, when you look at, uh, at this area, this is really, again, pretty much what we know as the West Bank. And this would only formalize what's already in place. That's the difference. And it's never really been considered before. 
because the one thing about it, when you read the details of it, and you can do it tonight if you are interested, you could do it tonight, you could go home and you could download or just you know, pull up on the screen the entire proposal. It's called uh, uh, Peace to Prosperity, and I'll have a, I have a picture of it here. And when you read it, like I did the first time I read it, it was only a couple of paragraphs in, and I thought, this is a business proposal. And, and, and uh, it's supposed to get you to land and peace and all the rest of it, but it's done differently. It's not, it, it isn't the, the carrot that's dangled that if you give up land, you'll get peace down the road. It's basically saying, we'll deal with the whole land thing later. Let's get everybody on board. And, and if people are being successful, that would end up really kind of end around bypassing the people that are really the ones fomenting all of the, the terrorism and the hatred and all the rest of that. So on paper, it sounds great. But the reasons that Muslims hate Jews is spiritual. It has nothing to do with anything. Nobody cared about this land 150 years ago. It didn't matter because it wasn't in the hands of Jewish people. You, you find that once Israel wanted it and became, was talking about becoming a, a nation again, now everybody cares about it. Um, Muslims didn't pilgrimage to the Al-Aqsa Mosque. They didn't go to the Dome of the Rock. It wasn't an important part. Now it's their third most holy place in, in the entire of Islam. But before that, go read the things that John Twain, or John Twain, <laughs> that's, a, that's halfway between John Twain and Mark Twain, or John, John Wayne and Mark Twain. So um, go read the things that, uh, that Mark Twain had to say about Israel when he visited it in the 1800s. He just, you know, basically it's a place where those, they, it's like they grow rocks there. <laughs> and they, when you go there, you understand the places that are not developed. You can understand why somebody would come away with that, that kind of a view of it. So here's what you could look at again tonight. Any person anywhere in the world could just look for this. Peace to prosperity. I even put the, uh, the website here um, if anybody was interested, but it's very simple. If you were to just put up peace to prosperity, White House, Peace to Prosperity, Abraham Accords, or whatever else, this is what was put out by our White House. And it's just, it's right there and it's easy to read. And when you read it, once again, you start to find out that it says some really interesting things in it because for the first time when you read it, you just go, they're being honest for a change. They'll say the biggest obstacles to any of this is the terrorist organizations, some of them right inside of Israel. They're the problem. They need to be bypassed. They need to be gone around and let the people you know, find a way to, to get different leaders for themselves. And until they do that, there's no way that those people will be able to participate. And it just says that. Now, everything before this, they would never say such a thing. It's just, you'll never say it. Because, of course, it's, that's how politicians frame debates. You can't say the obvious. You can't say what's true because you're liable to make people angry. This was put together. It's like, we don't care if you don't like it. Now, if you remember, Bahrain, I believe, got involved with this. A couple of the uh, uh, Arab uh, states, the uh, uh, UAE uh, states were involved. And there was talk about Saudi Arabia, I think Morocco, uh, a couple of the Northern Africa countries were working on it. But as soon as Netanyahu was taken from office, it really kind of got put down. And especially when our administration changed two years ago, it wasn't going to be uh, looked after. The thing with Netanyahu coming back in, he's one of the, the people that was at the ground floor of this, and now he's back in charge. So when you start to hear the things that he is beginning to say and what's being reported there, you just realize it's going to get really interesting over these next couple of years. So that first question that I'll usually get asked when I say something like that, well, but you're planning to go, aren't you? Yeah, and I plan to come home too. I don't think anything's going to blow up while I'm there. I'm not worried about that. Um, do I think that, that you know, a year or two down the road that this may be my last trip there? Very good possibility that there might very well be. This might be the last time that we go. But whether that's the case or not doesn't much matter. This, I believe, you're going to start, whether they call it this or not, the template's already in place and the participating countries that started before all the changes are still on board with it. So it is to put um, vitality back into the country, especially coming out of covid and Netanyahu is, uh, what, I, what I know of him being a free market guy, when we were there earlier this last year, th you could tell everywhere that we went, the devastation of the COVID shutdowns, it, it, it did so much damage to their country because it's so dependent on tourism. 
that um, there would have to be something far worse, I think, than even the last COVID outbreak for them to shut down again under Netanyahu's watch. I don't think he'll do it. But um, be that as it may, there, um, there are so many very interesting things that are taking place. So let me just go through what I would say are my first impressions of this. And uh, I know that you're probably wondering, well, why are you going to do impressions? Um, not those kind of impressions. It's written like a business proposal. And uh, it's intended to marginalize the radicals, which I've said. This is pretty much what I've already said to this point. It formalizes what already exists for the most part. It's, that's the land that's already kind of allotted the way that it is. Uh, it codifies what's already the reality. And if you were to visit there and go through the territories with that map versus what you saw in 47, you'd realize it's pretty much the same thing that was proposed back then. And it leaves veto power in Israel's hands. So everything that's been agreed to if there was an outbreak of violence and uh, terrorist uh, attacks and whatnot coming out of the West Bank or even Gaza, which still does to this day, comes out of Gaza, but there's really nothing that anybody has anything to do with in Gaza. It's kind of just, it's locked in. You can't do a whole lot coming in and out of there. It's not of great importance to us when we go to visit it. So we just, we're in that general area when we're way, way down south for about a half of a day. But after that, we're not involved with it. But um, the West Bank is still very much involved. Jerusalem sits in what is known as the West Bank or Judea Samaria. And so everywhere around there that we visit, we're technically in the West Bank, but you don't realize it because the Jews are very, very careful about everything that takes place in those areas. There's too many people there not to worry about it, not to be careful of what takes place in it. So I believe this will be a template and uh, it'll be something like this because clearly the land for peace is a joke. But the idea of trying to put something together that people would say, well, yeah, that works for both sides and all the rest of it, it'll be interesting to see what they're going to do with this over the next, uh, what I would say, year and a half, maybe two years. Neither Trump nor Kushner are the Antichrist. <laughs> so that was one of the things we heard all the time. He must be the Antichrist because of this. Or Kushner must be the Antichrist. Sorry, but they don't have the qualifications. So uh, also, it identifies all of the previous failures, which is really kind of an interesting thing when you read through it. They basically said, here's what you guys have tried so many times, and I always make the, the reference to Humpty Dumpty here. It's basically like, well, the king's horses have had five cracks at it, the king's horsemen, they want their fifth try, and we're going to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. How long have you, if you've been paying attention, heard whatever leader, we're going we're to bring a two-state solution? Side by side, living in peace. I mean, I could, almost, I could almost tell you before they say it what they're going to say. We've heard it so many times. This doesn't even attempt to use that same kind of language. It's completely different this time around. So it's pretty fascinating for me as I read through those things. So, of course, here was what we saw as soon as it started to go. Um, this is all the way back to when they first put it out. But Iran says Bahrain normalizing ties with Israel is, quote, shameful. Now, when they were the first of the, the countries that were starting to talk very seriously, they came in right about the same time as the UAE. Do you realize that, it, well, you would realize if you started to read through it, the whole thing was put together to make Iran the, the pariah. Make them, nobody wants anything to do with them because they're the radicals, they're the terrorists, they're the funders, they're the, the state sponsors of terrorism. If you can get other Muslim nations to normalize their ties with Israel, you so marginalize Iran because even people who should be their allies are not going to have, you know, they're, they're not going to want to do business with, with Iran. So, of course, they're going to be the first people that were going to come out and say something about it. You expect that. Of course, they're going to say something about that. But if you don't know the breakdown of this, in Islam, there are two houses of Islam, Sunni and Shiite. The Shiites only account for 15% of Islam, roughly 12 to 15% of all of Islam. The rest are Sunni. Iran is Shiite. It's Shia. That's their arm of Islam. So they're a small group anyway, but they're, they're the, the worst of the worst when it comes to the state sponsor of, of, um, of terrorism. So as soon as this thing happened, who would I expect to be the first people out there that are having problem with other Muslim nations putting things together with Israel? Iran. So they were so predictable, exactly like you would expect them to be. In this one, Palestinians rally against Bahrain and Israel, Israeli normalization. Let's remember that as you're looking at this, in Israel, or in, in the, quote, Palestinian territory, of course, a completely fabricated group of people. There has never been a nation or a king or a people of Palestine. 
uh, that's it's really said as just kind of a uh, of a put down of Israel and their right to the land by creating a people that have never existed. But of course, we would expect this. So think all the way back to the founding of the PLO with Yasser Arafat, and up until recently, Mahmoud Abbas, who's now had to meet his maker. But um, those people that had been in, in place of, of heading up what was the, uh, the Palestinian Liberation, Liberation Organization, the PLO, then became the Palestinian Authority, they are like, bless you, they are like um, Jesse Jackson or Al Sharpton to us. These are people who are always going to say there's racism, and if they ever admitted that the problem was solved, then they don't really have a reason to exist anymore, so they're never going to admit it. These are basically the same guys. So the people inside the Palestinian territory are going to get worked up over this because their leaders are going to get worked up over it, and they're going to lie to the people, the rank and file. So again, the best way to try to get around them is to give their people hope for a better life, and that's the whole premise of this. So what will happen between now and when the Lord returns is anybody's guess. But the idea of changing the approach to what is a very, very old conflict, I think it's just very interesting that they're, they're proposing these kind of things. But the likely suspects are exactly the ones that have made all the noise that you would expect. Now, I'm going to run out of time very, very quickly. So I'm just going to read through a couple of these things really quick. Um, and we're not going to look at all of the text, especially you can't read that, can you? For the most part, so. The closer you are, the better your chances are, right? So it just tells you here, it says, um, the, uh, the time has come to end the conflict and to unlock the vast human potential and economic opportunity that peace will bring to Israelis, Palestinians, and the region as a whole. Just in that one sentence, you realize it's never been attempted in that way before. So the, the rest of the premise is that if we can bring prosperity, meaning people don't live in squalor, then maybe you can get them to start to look at all the other benefits that would be there. Now, of course, I'm looking at Glenn and Kim because they were there, but when we drove through Bethlehem, you have to go past the concrete wall to get into Bethlehem. It's one of the places where there are, there's an actual physical barrier because the Jews on the other side live so close to it, it's the only way to keep rocks or even worse, bullets, from flying across. So when there's very close proximity, Jews versus Arabs, they will put up a concrete wall. But most of the barriers are not that. But since you've been there, you know that as soon as you drive through, on one side of the street, you'll see a mansion. Across the street, you'll see a hovel, like, Me like being in Mexico, in places I've been there and you know, other places kind of where there is real abject poverty. But how is that possible right across the street from a palace? Because the people in the palace are connected to the money that comes in from foreign governments to take care of the, quote, Palestinians. It's obvious. Everywhere that you look where there is that kind of, it's, it's that obvious where there's a large uh, um, uh, collection or group of people who live in one particular area, you can tell who's connected by where they live. And again, sometimes it's right across the street from one another. It's, it's fascinating to watch. So this is really the premise of it. And I'm not, I've got pages of this that I've done, but because of time, I won't be able to get to them. But just that right there, just that sentence alone gives you an idea of how different this is. So if you find this to be interesting, read it for yourself and you'll just go, man, nobody has ever talked like this before. And the honesty of it is what's so refreshing. It's so different. They just say terrorists are terrorists and terrorists do what they do. And as long as they exist, we'll never get anywhere in this. Which really, if you think about it, the subliminal to that, you people who live under their rule need to do something about it if they won't get on board. Pretty interesting. So, I mean, there's <laughs> it's a gutsy approach, I will say that. Um, it's not wanting to advance. Okay. Um, we'll do one more um, right here. The one reason for the intractability of this problem is the... Uh, conflation of two separate conflicts and territorial security and refu uh, refugee between Israel and the Palestinians and a religious dispute. This is the first time that they've really gone into explaining the difference between those two things. There are the people who have a problem with it because of the land, and there are others who have a problem with it be because of the religion, so it goes. He, and, and this says it's both. Let's just be honest. The people who want the land want it over religious reasons, 
And there's no reason why it can't be a shared prosperity that you have. Again, people who wrote this are not believers. So they themselves don't understand that the spiritual outweighs anything else as far as the hatred. This is why the Antichrist will be able to do things that no one's done before because he'll get people who would otherwise not get on board to get on board. And I get that, ask, that question asked probably as many as any, uh, uh, or as much as any of the questions that I get. How do you propose that the, uh, the Antichrist will get the Muslims to agree to a temple being built? Have you ever asked that question yourself? How is that possible? How will we be able to get them to agree to that? And it's, to me, one of the easiest questions that I could ever possibly answer. Because he has got them to believe the lies of Islam. So if he's got them to believe the lies of Islam, he can go ahead and change it up on the fly and get them to accept this too. He owns them. As I am owned by the Father and, and the Holy Spirit governs my life, so they have in the total opposite way. If the devil wants them to agree to something like that, he can flip that switch. He owns them. No problem. It's a very simple remedy to a, what seems like a difficult question. It's actually one of the easiest of questions to answer. So, I'm going to go past these because time will not allow me to even begin to get to it. What I want to do is take a look at some of the, and this is, again, I guess I have to, I have to give this caveat. This is interesting if you're like really geeky on it, like I am. You might read this and go, I needed something to put me to sleep tonight, so I figured I'd read this. Me, I read this and I go, this blows my mind because it's, it's never even been thought of before, let alone attempted. It's fascinating. So if you're geeky about that stuff, as I am, you would find it interesting reading. So if you go home and start reading it and go, there's something really wrong with Chris, I will completely understand that. <clears throat> so this is from... <laughs> This is from September of this last year. Look at this. Israeli rabbi says that he is already holding meetings with the Messiah. So here's some of the things that are happening simultaneously. They're going to kick off and restart this work of the Abraham Accords. It's one of the things that Netanyahu wants to do. Meanwhile, the Orthodox, who comprise every seat other than that of his party, Benjamin Netanyahu's party, Everybody in his governing coalition of 64 seats in the Knesset is Orthodox. There are Orthodox rabbis that are saying, we are talking with the Messiah right here, right now. Now, when you find out what they mean, of course, they're saying, you know, it's not time. We're not going to reveal who it is, but we want you to know we're having ongoing discussions with him. Do I think they're talking to Jesus? No, I don't. But they could be. But they're not telling you anything about the conversations. But I find this to be really interesting because what it tells you is that there is a real desire on behalf of the Orthodox, let's get this going. But the problem is, as it was with Jesus, when you really get behind the scenes and hear what they have to say, what they're looking for is a political Messiah, just like they wanted Jesus to be. At their time, we want somebody to do something about the Romans. The people that are there now, our Messiah will give us back the Temple Mount, get rid of the Muslims, and it'll be all over. We'll go back to the way that things were before. So when these kind of things are happening, that is fascinating. So um, this is um, taken from the, uh, the article uh, in, a recent, oh, sorry, in a recent interview uh, on Israel, Israeli radio featuring prominent rabbis explaining that the Messiah is just about to reveal himself. So in their discussions, their Messiah is telling them, I'm going to re uh, be revealing myself very, very soon. And uh, uh, Rabbi Jizholz, told a religious broadcaster Radio 2000 that Rabbi Kayim uh, Kavaneski, who passed away earlier this year, had told him that he, Kavaneski, uh, was already in direct contact with the Messiah. To understand any religious Jews are talking this seriously, it's important to know that Rabbi uh, Kavaneski, Kav however you say that name, was considered one of the top three rabbis in the ultra-Orthodox Jewish community in Israel. The ultra-Orthodox, if they are in the, if they've won any seats in the Knesset, those people are now allied with the new government of Netanyahu. <coughs> yeah. So uh, here's one that, of course, this will make Mark's eyebrows raise. I wish as I was reading this, I could look at his face. Getting the word out that the Messiah is closer than ever is a matter of life and death. Haven't you heard of Gog and Magog? They're reading Ezekiel. 
This means that rabbis are reading the prophets and for the most, most of their lives they were told, stay away from the prophets. Spend your time in Torah. But when you read that and a rabbi says that, that means he understands the participants in the war and what that implies. When they're talking like this, A, that they're seeing their Messiah or having discussions with their Messiah and the Gog and Magog war, haven't you ever heard of that? So I read that and I about fell out of my seat when I read it. So this is what's going to happen very soon. This is what's going to happen very soon. Uh, right now, the situation is explosive more than you can possibly imagine. <laughs> yeah, that is interesting, isn't it? Now see again, remember, it's not Israel that precipitates the Gog-Magog war. It is those who want to come after Israel. Right now, one of the major participants in that war has their hands quite full up in Ukraine. So do I expect it to happen tomorrow? No. That's also why I don't expect it, uh, Russia to completely be decimated in some kind of a war up in the north, because then they would have to recover from that, become a power again, just to move down south. I don't think there's that much time on the clock. I could be wrong, and uh, if I am, we can have that discussion later. <laughs> Look at this one. Does anybody recognize this guy? His name is Menachem Schneerson. Yeah, no, it's not Wade. It's... <laughs> Menachem Schneerson, um, this, is, this is in New York. Um, he was a rabbi who died, gosh, it's got to be close to 15 years ago now, 10, 15 years ago. They were convinced that he was the Messiah. <coughs> And so the, uh, the Orthodox in New York especially were absolutely convinced of it. Uh, again, I'm going to look to you. Do you remember when we were especially up in the north around Galilee, do you remember seeing this guy's picture on the back of some of the, the signs? As we're on the road, you were seeing this, this guy's face there again. There are those who from the very moment that he died felt, uh, felt that he would be resurrected. And so they are once again really, really you, it's the first time that I have been in Israel where I saw that many just this last May that I've seen that many of these, um, these posters with his face on it. At the same time that you have people saying, we're talking with Messiah. It just, he doesn't have to resurrect. They don't have to be talking to Messiah. It's that they're talking. It's the expectation and the anticipation. I want you to realize this. In the, ultra, in the Orthodox uh, community, they are as excited at that potential as we are about Jesus rapturing the church. Let that sink in. Here is, again, September of 2022, and Israel, um, red heifers arrive in Israel. And they are, of course, they have a shelf life. So once they get to three years old, this has got to happen. Okay? you got to be, and they will not make them into burgers. So there are five of them, meaning that if something happened to one or more of them, they... And again, Mark points this out, it's very important. They don't have to have it because the, the heifer was long after the, uh, the first of the sacrifices that were made. That became something later on. So it's not necessary. It wasn't necessary to the functioning of the tabernacle, certainly not of the temple, but in their mind it is. That's all that matters. So that's what you find, why they're so very, very invested in this. The, ref he the red heifer was the main component in a biblically mandated process of ritual pur purification for impurity that results from proximity or contact with a dead body. So if you remember, that came much later in the law. That wasn't at the, uh, at the beginning of the, um, the work taking, uh, taking place in the tabernacle. This was later on. So um, I'll just leave that part there because again, I'm, I'm out of time. So last couple of uh, things, if this will cooperate. This is just in the last, I just pulled these in the last week. So I wish that I could excerpt a whole bunch of the, the uh, details of this because it's so fascinating to read this. If, if we have an operational knowledge of how their politics works, if we are as far into the end, uh, the end times as I believe that we are, waiting for the, re the uh, removal of the church and all the rest of the things that are happening, the ramping up of the things happening there, I think, would be the same way. And again, if you ask me the question, are you really seriously planning on going there? Oh, man, can't wait to get there. I want to see what it's like on the ground. I'm very curious to find out what it's like in the day-to-day -day of things. 
And I actually, uh, I know that there are, are those that I talk with, I, I'll hear from them soon, the more that they read these kind of things. Well, what happens if something breaks out there? Well, if it does, that means I'll probably just meet you guys up in heaven after the rapture and say, dude, you ought to see where, what it looked like from where I was. So, <laughs> look at this. Israel, I'm sorry. Got to go back to it. Um, Israel must secure prophetic fulfillment, insists Netanyahu. So when everybody who is in your group is ultra-Orthodox, you don't have to worry about marginalizing maybe a very splintered group in your government. Because I'm going to show you who is part of his Knesset. So he can speak and, and appeal to the Orthodox because they've just handed him power. 64 of the 120 seats are in the, in the possession of Likud and the rest of the groups. Likud is his party. Like we say Republicans or Democrats, Likud is his party. So Netanyahu acknowledges God's hand and the need for faith, but also says Israel must actively fulfill its prophetic calling. When you have a prime minister talking like that, imagine a president talking like that here in this country. Yeah, so... That's so cool. New Israeli government swearing in begins Netanyahu's sixth term as the prime minister. Now, you can find all kinds of news sources because they're all talking about it, and it really happened at the last hour. He, he almost wasn't able to put it together, but they were finally able to do it. And again, he has people who are so aligned with him ideologically, politically, but all those people are also what we would call socially very conservative, very much Zionist, like people need to return to their land, Ilea is what they call that, that they're going to come back to the land, and that some of them are even nationalists, like we need to get the foreign people out because they're just a corrosive influence. So yeah, um, that's going on. So along, here's, here are, I put this together today, just wanted to give you what the latest is. Up here, it just tells you who is part of his coalition. So here is, of course, Likud which is Zionist, it's conservative, it's big on military. 32 seats, that's what Benjamin Netanyahu's party is, Likud. So that's the largest of them all. Um, and many of these are not all that old. And sometimes they were called something different two or three years ago. They changed the name of it, but the people still are involved with it. There's this one that is also Zionist, it's conservative, and it's also very strong military. Some of these I'm not going to try to do it. I'm not going to try and say it. Religious Zionism... Orthodox, it's Zionist, it's also nationalist. We've got to get the foreigners out because they're damaging the country. And so these are, these are the ones that say we shouldn't have um, social safety net for people that are not putting into the system. They're like our very far right in this country. So uh, Noam is uh, Orthodox, they're Zionist, nationalist. You know what I mean when I say that, right? Zionist, Jews need to come back to their homeland. Nationalist is... Our only concern is what's right for Jews and Jews only. And uh, so they're also very conservative. So these are the ones, the, the pro-LGBTQ and all that group that you have, especially around Tel Aviv and along the coast, they say we should do nothing in any way as a government to promote any of that kind of stuff. It's corrosive to society. And most of them are going to have that um, within their, their groups. Most all of these, because they're orthodox, are going to have that same, that same view. Torah says no, absolutely no to homosexuality. This is the most vocal that you've ever had of a government in Israel across the board being right of center. So you have, uh, of course, Shaz, who's been around since the 80s. And theirs is, they're, they're Zionists, they're nationalists, all those other things. But when you see Sephardic, think European, especially Southern European Jews that had immigrated back in. And theirs is more directed towards that group of people who have come back into the nation. Uh, United Torah, also Orthodox and Conservative. So he's got 64 of the 120 seats. So that's more than the last government had. And uh, the, the thing that he has as a benefit, you don't have a lot of disagreement among these groups here like you had in the last one. You had Arabs, you had right of center, left of center, you had liberals, you had conservatives. It was crazy. So, um, of course, it was very, very, it was tenuous at best. They couldn't get much of anything done because you're always trying to make everybody happy and nobody agreed with anybody. So, Netanyahu's government vows to expand West Bank settlements and annex occupied territory. 
So that means basically taking back the uncontest or the contested stuff, especially they're talking about the places that the Palestinian authority has just kind of let rot. It's time for us to take that back. So in this, I decided I'd bring this back up. They're not talking about doing it here. They're never going to give this back. We're talking about all this stuff primarily in this area all the way into Jerusalem. And whenever you hear East Jerusalem, you're just saying this. This is Jerusalem here. That's where the Temple Mount is on the eastern part of it. So when you see that picture of the... Everybody always takes that picture of that golden dome and the city behind it. You're taking that from the eastern hill, which is the Mount of Olives. And in between you and that golden dome is the Kidron Valley that you hear about all the time. It's not a valley, it's a ditch. <laughs> so as we think of it, we got valleys that go on for miles and miles and miles. Theirs is hundreds of yards. The Kidron Valley is only hundreds of yards wide. So this tiny little territory is just, it's, it's the center of, of man's conflict through the ages. And it's really going to ramp up as the Lord gets uh, to the place of returning. So... Here's one of the things, I, uh, as I close, I'm already late. Ehud Barak, anybody remember that guy? Can you see his face? He was once a prime minister there, back in the day. Ehud Barak. So, um, general at one point, served in the military, you know, war hero kind of a guy. But here's when you realize just how much the, the rhetoric is almost identical here versus there. Ehud Barak, government shows signs of fascism. Oh, seriously? They're using that kind of bumper sticker and slogan type stuff there too, like they do here? Yep, because it's, okay. So uh, mass, look at this, mass nonviolent revolt may be needed. He hasn't even got the seat warm yet, and now the opposition is doing this. So the, the people that are out of power are just as unhinged there as they are here in our country. It doesn't change. Look at, um, I, I pulled an excerpt of this because I thought it was interesting, and now it doesn't want to advance. There we go. Let me just run through these really quick. Uh, former Prime Minister Ehud Barak on Friday accused the new government led by Benjamin Netanyahu of working to bring down Israeli democracy and said the sign, there are signs of fascism. Does that sound like us? And they're a threat to democracy, and they're fascists. This is what Antifa said around here. Antifa is anti-fascists, and they act like fascists, which is really kind of interesting. Speaking at the memorial ceremony for his successor and IDF chief of staff, uh, Amnon Lipkin Shahak, uh, uh, who died in, in uh, 2012, he said that the High Court of Justice proves unable to defend Israeli and Israel rather, and its democracy from hard right coalition, Israeli citizens will have to stage a nonviolent revolt to bring it down. And again, that it hasn't really even had a chance to start doing things, and this is the kind of rhetoric that's happening on the political side. Look at this down here. The government is carrying out a coup if Israel be, uh, in Israel before our eyes with its racism, corruption, um, neutering of the justice system, politicization of the police and undermining of the chain of command in the IDF. Does this sound like uh, take out Israel and make it the U.S.? It's the same nonsense. Look at this. Together they are bringing down democracy. It sounds exactly like everything that we heard in the Trump years and then afterward when J6 happened. So the whole thing is just like, my gosh, they are just not even creative. They're just taking our template and, and putting in the different names. Let me end with this. Deuteronomy 7. This is one of those things that I, I, I love when we read this passage, and I want to be reminded about who Israel is as far as God is concerned, and it's, uh, it's important for us to recall this. Um, and remind that, um, be reminded that as far as Israel is concerned, the, uh, the, there's never been a time when they've been great in number compared to everyone around them. And this is what sets um, Judaism, uh, aside from all of the other world religions, look at what it said here, and uh, we'll be getting there in due course, actually, in the next couple of weeks. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God, Deuteronomy 7, and the Lord God has chosen you to be a people for himself and a special treasure above all the people on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you or choose you because you were more in number than any of the other people, for you were the least of all people, but because the Lord loves you. And because he would keep an oath that he swore to your fathers, 
The Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage from the hand of Pharaoh. God has never stopped loving his people, clearly. And he's brought them back in the land like he promised that it would happen. It took almost 2,000 years of their displacement, but he's brought them back nonetheless. The promise he made was fulfilled, and it's there. But this is what makes him different, the God of the Bible, different than Islam or any of the rest of them. None of those others would be able to tell you that they love you on the individual le uh, level, let alone come and tell you in person and then demonstrate it, as Jesus did for us. It makes them different. There's no other religion like um, religious belief that man has that is anything that rivals what we see in Scripture. Last one that I'll show you, and it's from Genesis chapter 12, and it's what needs to be reminded. Uh, the church needs to be reminded of this as well, especially when they start to dabble in taking sides on this and thinking uh, that Israel is doing something that they should not be doing. I believe everything that happens in Israel since 1948 onward has been at the orchestration of the Lord, absolutely. If he wasn't behind them, they wouldn't have survived 48, they wouldn't have survived 67, and they wouldn't have survived 73. They wouldn't survive any particular day. Their enemies would destroy them if it wasn't for that God was, was for them. But this is what has been said already in the past, and God never put an end to this. It was an open-ended statement when he made it, and it stays in effect forever. It is a forever promise. The Lord said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And every time that I read that, I start to think about every time that we have any interaction with them as a nation, tread lightly and make sure that what you're doing is the right thing because we could very easily, and I believe in some ways we already have, uh, you will begin to get the, the uh, business end of God's displeasure if you do things that are subversive towards Israel as a nation, and we are doing that. So um, President Trump was very, very agreeable towards Israel and its right to the land. Uh, the current administration is very, very much belligerent towards Israel and doesn't like them very much, all the way back to the Obama years. And this is just a carbon copy. It's the same people behind the scenes in the Biden administration as it was in the Obama one. And they have absolute contempt for Israel. So that, of course, bothers me, but we can't do anything about it. And guess what? God already knows. How cool is that? So with that, we will end this. And I, I know that there was a lot there. If it's something that you're interested in, uh, I know that Jack, uh, did you keep a copy of it? So if you want to get the slides and you're interested in going back and reading it, especially that stuff that was highlighted that I just ran right past, um, you can get the panels from this. Um, I have them in PDF as well. If that's easier for you to read. So let's, uh, let's close with a word of prayer. And I don't know if you want to do anything um, with questions or whatever. Okay, Father, we thank you so much for our time together and, and for the interest that this really should peak in each of us. And as we uh, understand the world around us and see things taking place, God, we await your return. We are excited to see what you're going to be doing, especially among your people, Israel, the things that are taking place there. It seems that your handprint is all over these things. And uh, we do pray that many will come to know you in these times because there's things taking place that their eyes are open to it. May it be the same here in this country. We give you all thanks and praise and ask God that you would help us in our understanding as we watch these things unfold. Help us to use it as an opportunity to share the good news with the people around us. And we give you all thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen? All right.